All right, figured I'd go over airflow in a hover. Just understand why it requires more power to hover out of ground effect than in ground effect. Imagine that uh, I'm standing on a frictionless surface and my whole intent is to turn around and look behind me. Well, without friction, I have nothing to push against to turn myself around the other direction. Luckily, right next to me, to my right side, is a running track, running walking track. There's going to be two people that come by me. These are my two opportunities to spin around. I could utilize them, push against them, and turn about face to look behind me. As I'm standing there, I see on the running track in the distance a guy sprinting really, really fast coming up. He's going to run past me. As I look back, I plan to time uh, my slap on his back in order to propel myself around. So as he's sprinting really, really fast, he gets right next to me, a beam of me. I take my hand and I slap his back with X amount of force. My fingers barely graze his shirt and I don't move hardly at all. So I, didn't, I wasn't able to turn around. Luckily, the second guy, he's coming up behind me. He's walking very, very slow, as close to rest as possible, but still moving my direction from rear to front. As he gets next to me, a beam, same place, I strike with the same amount of force on his back. And when I do, I hit his back really, really hard. I spin around three or four times, and he gets pushed from a light, very slow walk. He gets pushed into a trot. He starts moving pretty quick. Why didn't I get the energy exchange with the first guy as I did with the second guy? That's because the first guy was already traveling in the direction I wanted him to go at the speed I wanted him to go. So whenever I tried to apply that force to send him there, he was already going in that direction. Therefore, there was no energy exchange. The second guy, he was as close to rest, and I struck him with X amount of force to put him in motion at that speed. And uh, when I hit him, he moved at the speed I, or I propelled him at in the direction that I propelled him at. And there was a huge energy exchange which spun me around. That's called momentum theory. It's all about the exchange in energy, the exchange in force, the force I needed to spin around. I needed to exchange that from an external source. And I did that with the second guy because he was moving uh, really, really slow, not at the speed that uh, I wanted to propel him at. I wanted to propel him a little bit faster. So I was able to exchange energy with him and spin myself around and move him in another direction. So when you look at wingtip vortices, think about that. Look on wingtip vortices. Whenever they are at the tip of our blade, we push them down, they're coming up and recirculating. High pressure underneath, low pressure above. Air particle, by the time it hits the blade, is already traveling in the direction down that I want to propel it at the speed I want to propel it. That's going to be at the tip. Really, really fast speed there or very little energy exchange at the tip of the blade. As we move closer in, the velocity of that air coming down, even though it's going in the same direction, the velocity is going slower. Therefore, I'm going to get more and more energy the further inboard I move from the air. So, if I had to plot speed on here, just so you could understand it, it would look just like this. Here, velocity is really, really high and a vertical, the vertical velocity is really, really high in a downward trajectory. So I get less amount of force and I start getting more and more force the more I move in based off of its speed only. So over here in ground effect, the wingtip vortices are smaller. Why is it smaller? Because as air comes down, it has to move somewhere. It has to go out the, the rotor disc. So as it exits out the rotor disc, it's moving out at a speed, a given speed. Uh, so when air particles come down through and out, it knocks these wingtip vortices off their trajectory. They want to recirculate, but uh, that speed that's going on, this is the speed. As air particles go down through the rotor disc and out, knocks these wingtip vortices off their trajectory of recirculation. Now this is moving out at a given speed with a given amount of energy, and these wingtip vortices are utilizing energy to stay in their recirculation. So whenever these air particles knock these air particles off their trajectory, they move out and they can't build and consume most of the rotor blade. There's always going to be some amount of vortice though on there. If you move over here, very high uh, correction, very large wingtip vortices. Why is that? Because 
air goes down through the rotor system and has no trajectory of hitting these air particles and knocking them off their trajectory. So people always ask, I thought the angle of attack changes on one side or the other. I have to move my cyclic over in one direction which puts more angle of attack uh, on one side than the other. Well in this situation here and all situations the angle of attack can't change. Since uh, the angle of attack is equal to force, how much force is on one side holding it up has to be the same on the other side otherwise you'll flip over. So inner, the angle of attack doesn't change for the average over the entire blade on each side. So the average angle of attack doesn't change. But local angle of attacks along each blade element, which means if you broke this blade up into an infinite number of sections, each section will have a different angle of attack from this side versus this side. Because the wingtip vortices here are so much larger on the out of ground effect than in ground effect, it's consuming so much of my usable blade to send air particles down and propel me up. To make that energy exchange, I have less blade to work with on this side that's usable. Again, because the air particles are traveling down the trajectory and speed that I want them to go, I'm not going to exchange much energy here. I start becoming more and more effective to where now I actually have some usable blade to make lift with. If I look over here, I got a lot of blade. So if you measure the distance between there of what's actually creating lift for us, uh, this right here is so much shorter. So in the equation, if to get force, to get the angle of attack, to get the force, we need to accelerate, or it's mass times acceleration. Force equals mass times acceleration. Well, I'm affecting less mass, less air particles here on this side than I am over here because I got more blade to affect more air particles. Because I'm affecting less air particles, if this variable decreases, correction, if this variable decreases here, in order for force to stay the same, I have to increase the acceleration variable. So now on this side, I have to put in a high angle of attack along the blade here. The only way that I could increase my mass, correction, make up the difference from my mass, is to accelerate air particles more. And in turn, I actually end up getting more mass as well. There's an equilibrium as I accelerate them. I'm starting to pull more air particles through the rotor system here. So on this side, you're going to have a very high induced flow because this part of the rotor blade that you have left, not affected, as much by wingtip vortices is going to have to make up the difference to equal the same amount of force on your in ground effect side. If you look on your in ground effect side, you don't really need to pull a whole lot of pitch in the blade, their angle of attack in the blade, because you got more blade area to work with, you're working with more mass, therefore you could accelerate it slower since you're working with more air particles. So you'll find induced flow much slower on in ground effect side as out of ground effect. That's what's going on. Now, the question is what what causes more power to be required out of ground effect than in ground effect? Well, if you had your airfoil, so we got lift, drag, and then our total aerodynamic force, TAF, right here. Whenever we have to put more pitch in the blades, this shifts aft, and now our resultant lift vector is going to be actually slowing down the rotor blade a lot more, almost as if there's a parachute uh, attached to the rotor blade and the parachute is trying to slow it down. The further the rotor blade tilts aft, you're lifting, not vertical, but you're lifting the blade in a direction that slows it down. You're actually lifting it slower as opposed to lifting vertical straight up. And it's that shift in the total aerodynamic force aft is what's causing your power, higher power requirement out of ground effect. In ground effect, if your rotor blade, if your total aerodynamic force is more vertical and less less aft, then your power requirement is going to be less. If you're out of ground effect, where you have a lot of pitch in your blade relative uh, to its plane of rotation, if relative to its plane of rotation, the total aerodynamic force is shifted aft, then you're going to be lifting your blade slower. You're going to be forcing your blade to slow down, and your engine is going to be required to provide the power to accelerate it back to 100 percent. It's going to require more energy to do that. Energy will then be power. It requires more power to hover out of ground effect than it does in ground effect. Now there are 
situations you get into where the air has nowhere else to go whenever it leaves the uh, rotor disc but to be recirculated back into the rotor. And that's if you land next to something, some sort of object that you don't give it enough room. You hit it just the right spot and it's called interference. Air will go down through the rotor system, exit out this direction towards the, a building or some object, and then have nowhere else to go but go vertical and then force feed itself right back into the rotor system. Now you're dealing with the rotor that's dealing with its own air. And it's settling into its own air. It would be similar, similar to settling with power. It's interference. You're feeding off of your own downwash, recirculating it back into the rotor disc. And again, now it's traveling down in the direction at the speed you want to propel it. Therefore, there's not going to be energy, any energy exchange between the rotor blade and the air particles. As opposed to the other side where air can clean escape easily out into infinity you're not going to get into an interference problem over here of recirculation only on the side where this object is you're force feeding the rotor system its own air again and that side right there may feel like it's going to settle with power and you're going to lose a lot of lift on this side if you're very heavy if your power margin is very narrow to hover, then this right here could put you over and you'd crash land. And that's called interference. If you get in a situation like this and you're able to land it safely, just taxi forward or hover in ground effect. Hopefully if you can still hover in ground effect far enough forward to get away from the object that is forcing the recirculation, the re-ingestation of air.